الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مفتح الأبواب ويا مسبب الأسباب ويا دليل الحائرين توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين وفوض أمر إلى الله إن الله بصير من الإباد Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters the topic Christ in Islam when for the very first time I mooted this subject in my own city of Durban and I had a lecture delivered in the city hall and when we advertised this topic there was a consternation among the Christians in my country that here is somebody coming along to produce another Christ and at the very beginning of my talk in the city hall I had to assure that part of my audience who were Christians that we Muslims have not got another Christ there is only one Christ and that is Jesus Christ I had to assure them, calm them so where do we get this idea from about Jesus and the Christ we go to the, our book of authority the Muslim he goes to the Holy Quran and I'm suggesting to my brothers and sisters that each and every one of you you need a copy of the Holy Quran a translation like the one I have in my hand this is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali this book here has got the Arabic text English translation and commentary and it has a very comprehensive index makes things easy for you anything that you want to know in this book of God you have everything on your fingertips you remember on Friday I gave a talk here and I mentioned about Jesus that Jesus is mentioned in this volume 500% more times than Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam something unimaginable you can't imagine a man goes and writes a book and he, he, he keeps himself out of it he's promoting Jesus Jesus 500% more time than himself does it make sense which writer which biographer authority writer will do a thing like that oh, no. this is not his work if it is his work then naturally he would have promoted himself but now I said 500% more times you remember that those of you who were here can somebody give me the figure how many times is Jesus mentioned in this book of God please put up your hand don't shout just please put up your hand I want you to present you with a book how many times is Jesus mentioned in the Quran yes my child you huh huh 25 is right is mentioned in the Quran five times total four times as Muhammad and one time as Ahmad which is an, an alternative way of naming of the Prophet altogether five Jesus 25 amazing this book now where are you gonna find this in this encyclopedia of 2,000 pages you're gonna start paging through looking for Jesus 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 and you might have missed them all all 25 you might not have come across a single one of them no what you do is you go to the index at the back of this volume there's a very comprehensive index you go to the index and just like a dictionary look for Jesus and the J everything about Jesus in the Quran on your fingertips I'm opening the index starts the first item the first item Jesus under the heading Jesus a righteous prophet he's the true prophet of God chapter 6 verse 85 second item his birth mentioned in two places in Surah Ali Imran chapter 3 Ayah 42 onwards chapter 19 verses 23 onwards and on and on and on everything about Jesus on your fingertip you don't have to start fumbling through 
paging through, looking for Jesus or for Muhammad or for Moses for that matter. You'll get the shock of your life. When I tell you this, another mighty messenger of God, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, we call him Moses, the holy prophet Moses. I can't imagine anybody guessing. How many times is he mentioned in this book? The prophet of the Jews. No, no, he's our prophet. But the so-called, they say he's the prophet of the Jews. All right, the prophet of the Jews. How many times is Moses mentioned in this book? I don't know what to give you. This book is too little. Anybody can tell me or anywhere near enough? Moses, how many times is Moses mentioned in this book? Huh? How much? 52. Anybody else? Not likely. I will give you this Quran at the end of the talk. If you can give me anywhere 10, within 10 of that number, within 10. Forget, forget the exact number. Please don't shout. Just put up your hand. You. Huh? Another hundred times. You. Huh? Hundred and twenty. Hundred and twenty. Come, 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 come. No, it looks like I'll have to take this Quran back home to South Africa. <laughs> 136 times. 136 times the Holy Prophet Moses is mentioned in this book. And you people are thinking that we are the Antichrist, we are the anti-Jews. This book is not anti-Jews nor anti-Christian. You are misjudged, doing injustice to this book. Obtain a book. Muslims and non-Muslims, you need this. You need this. To the Christians I say, even if you want to fight the Muslims, you need this book. Because this book will tell you now how the Muslims are thinking. So you can plan your strategies. If you know the man's book. So the Muslim needs it. And to the Muslim I'm suggesting that get this volume as quick as possible. It's the best investment you can make in your life. The best investment I made was to buy this book in 1935. In 1935, it cost me five pounds. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. It cost me two pound, 10 shillings. Two pound, 10 shillings. That was 50% of my wages. Half my month's salary, I was getting five pounds a month and I paid two pound, 10 for it. 50. I have no regrets. Wallah, no regrets. He changed my life and all this what I'm doing is because of reading this book. You ought to. My dear brothers and sisters, I suggest that you get this book and look up this subject, Jesus. His birth. His birth. The Qari, the reciter, he read these verses from the Holy Quran. And the young man, the translator, he translated it. But to make you to absorb that message, I will repeat them for you. But what I recommend is that you get this volume, look up the birth of Jesus, and memorize the verse. Memorize the verse, the ayah in Arabic. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu. With the meaning. With the meaning. It says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah has tafaki, Allah has chosen thee, wa taharaki, and purified thee, wa tafaki, Allah nisail alameen, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is described in the Quran as a woman chosen above the women of all nations. And I'm saying that this honor, this high honor, is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in the Christian Bible, whether the Protestant version or the Roman Catholic version. I have them both. Nowhere you find anything like this. It continues. Ya Maryam Muknuti li Rabbiki wasjudi warkai marraqeen. So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O messenger by inspiration. Memorize the meaning side by side. And once you have done that, the blessings, the blessings. You know, every time we utter the words of the Quran, we are told 
that for every letter of the Quran that you utter, we get 10, 10, 10 sawabs, blessings. When we say Alif, Lam, Mim, this word, these letters, Alif, Lam, Mim is not a word. Our Prophet said it's not a word. There are three letters. Alif, separate, Lam, separate, Mim, separate. Alif, Lam, Mim. That's the beginning of Surah Baqarah, the second chapter. Alif, Lam, Mim. He says, when you say Alif, Lam, Mim, for every letter you get ten, ten, ten sawabs, blessings. When you say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, if you count the letters, there are 19. You get 190 sawabs, blessings. Each and every one of you, you are hearing it, you get 190, 190 each. I get 190 and each and every one of you get 190. This is the one you have to do business with him, with Allah. You don't have to keep count. You just keep on, let him keep the account. On the day of judgment, inshallah, Allah will give it to you. So, my presence is, you repeat these words. I haven't counted the letters. I didn't count them. I said, let him keep the account. Allah, let him keep the account. You just do your job. So blessings, blessings, blessings. Then when you repeat, when you when you're translating it and when you're pronouncing these words and memorizing it, your English improves. Because this is not a part of your ordinary vocabulary. Behold, behold, see, the angel said, O Mary, God has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations new construction of sentences, new vocabulary, this is all yours. Blessings, blessings, blessings. And you find an opportunity for practicing this. This is a, an ocean of Christianity, like my country, South Africa. It's an ocean of Christianity. Whichever way we look at as a Christian, our fellow workers, our employers, our employees, our neighbors, Christians, Christians, Christians. Now, create an opportunity. Your neighbors, I'm talking to my sisters now. Your neighbors, your Christian neighbors, Wish them well. Every morning you say good morning, good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, good evening, good evening. Mm. And before long, invite them home for a cup of tea. Say, come, come, Mary, uh, Elizabeth, come and have tea with us. Bring the children along. And I tell you what our tea and our samosas, our tea and our bhajias can do. You can't imagine the Malays in South Africa, they give tea and kusistas. I don't know whether you know those things. You might have some specialities of your own. You know, you Muslim ladies from Indonesia and from Malaysia and from Bangladesh and where and where not. You also have, and Lebanon, you know, your sweet meats. You know, <laughs> look, we have our specialities, each and every one. And each and every one of our specialities is unique. Feed them, feed them, give it to them and see how you enslave them. I tell you, my people in South Africa, with our food, we enslave the white man, the African, the colored, the other Indian. You know, because our tastes are different. Our cooking is different from the other Indian. Man, everybody, you know, everybody, you know, he, he hogs it. He hogs it, you know. Our food, you know, is irresistible. Well, I tell you. You enslave the people with food. There is no better way to do, get in the heart of a man than through his stomach. I'm telling you, there is no better way. Now, this is, I will start telling you now. The experience of our Nabi Akram Salaam. This is what the example he set, but nobody talks about it. But now I'm telling you, do this exercise. Call this your neighbors. And after a while having tea, he says, Sister, have you seen the Quran? He says, No. Would you like to have a look at it? She must say, Have you got an English translation? He said, Yes, yes. No. Nobody says he doesn't want to see. It's the nature of man, we are all inquisitive by nature. You know, we want to know, so let's just see. You bring the Quran, open it, chapter 3, verse 42. And if you can, can read Arabic, read it to them. Read this Arabic to them. You don't know what this Arabic is doing to them. This is Allah's kalam. It shakes up people, friends and foe alike. It shakes them up. And Allah tells us in the Quran, He says that when these our verses are recited to them, the sincere person says tears well up in their eyes. Really, I've seen it. The Roman Catholic especially. The Roman Catholic especially. You recite the Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa is qalatil balaikatu ya Maryam woman. And translate. Ya Maryam woman. And on and on. Translate it for them. Let them hear. And this will not convert them. A lifetime of rust 
what has gathered and prejudice. You can't remove this with a cup of tea in the kusistas. But, man, share it with them. Tell them that this is what the Quran says about your Jesus, that he is one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. In these verses that I read, it speaks about his miraculous birth. And I had an experience in 1977. In 1977, I was planning to go to Indonesia. I haven't read there yet. This is my Indonesian brothers. If they're here, they can know. From 1977, I'm trying to get into Indonesia, a Muslim country. But I have failed so far. 77. But as soon as I make up my mind to, to go to a foreign country, I want to master a bit of that, that nation's language. That's a hobby. It's a like that, I can give you some 20 different languages. You think I'm bluffing you? What do you want to hear? Spanish, French, Sudanese. Sudan is the language of the Dinka, John Kara. You know, they're at war. The language of the Dinka, Swahili, English, Afrikaans, Zulu. What do you want to hear? Hebrew. What do you want to hear? <laughs> Indonesian. I wanted an Indonesian Bible to master a few words of the Indonesian. So I went to the Bible house in Durban. In my, every city in South Africa has got a Bible house where they sell Bible, specialize in Bibles in different, different languages. I want an Indonesian Bible. They said they haven't got it. Okay. I said, try Johannesburg. They might have it. So when I went to Johannesburg, I go to the Bible house in Johannesburg. And I go and search for this Indonesian Bible. And I got it. And I'm looking in the shelves, some other books, I see a New Testament, Greek and English. Like we have the Quran, Arabic and English, Greek and English, a New Testament. I took that big volume out and I'm starting to go through that. And the supervisor of the Bible house is watching me. You know, with this funny headgear and this beard. He says, what this guy is doing with all these expensive volumes? Because this was an expensive volume which I took down. Greek English of the New Testament. So he comes up to me, he says, good morning. I said, good morning. He said, what makes you interested in these books? I said, no, I do comparative religion and I have come across something here in this Greek English of the New Testament that can be of use to me. He found me an interesting character. He said, would you like to have a cup of tea with me? I said, no, I don't mind at all. So he took me into his office. I said, now, you know, we believe in Jesus. And this was something astonishing to this supervisor. And all the supervisors in South Africa of the Bible houses are retired reverends. This was a reverend Dunkers, reverend Dunkers. He's amazed. I said, you know, we believe in Jesus and in his miraculous birth. And so saying, I started repeating these verses from the Quran. We believe, we believe. And when I read it, he said, no, this is the same like my book. What you are saying now, that when the good news is given to Mary, the mother of Jesus in the Holy Quran, she says, She said, oh my Lord, how can I have a child when no man has touched me? Which means physically, sexually. No man has touched me. So the angel says, Qala yasha. Even so, Allah creates what he wills. Iza qada amran fa innama yakulu lahu kun fayakun. Whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to it, be, and he wills it and the thing comes into being. So the reverend says, man, this is the same as my book. I said, yes, on the face of it, it's the same. But if you look at it intently, you'll find the difference between my version and your version is chalk and cheese. You people know chalk and cheese? You know the difference between chalk and cheese? The Canadians didn't know. The Canadians, I'm telling you, when I went to Canada, I spoke about chalk and cheese. They didn't hear that phrase before. We, the English speaking people in South Africa, we know everybody knows chalk and cheese. Chalk and cheese may look alike, white, white, but it's a pose apart. You can't eat chalk, but you can eat cheese. No? But the Canadians didn't know. The Canadians didn't know. I'm telling you. I don't know whether you people know. Difference between chalk and cheese. The poles are, in other words, poles apart. So they said, how? 
I said, you know, in the Holy Bible, in the Gospel of St. Luke, we are told when this good news was given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, about the birth of the Holy Son, she says, how can this thing be when I know not a man? In the biblical language, no means sex. No, no, to no means no sexually. Not she doesn't know a man. She knows her uncle, her, her father's her neighbors. Surely she knows other men, but no, no, no. No in the biblical language means sex. When I have, in the Quran it says, no man has touched me. Again, it means not touched me, means had sex. Both the Quran and the Bible are saying the same thing. The replies to them are revealing. In the Holy Bible, the answer to Mary's protest was that the Holy Ghost will come upon thee. I'm reading. I'm reading the Bible to you. Look. The Holy Ghost will come upon thee and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. Now that gives you a mental picture. The Holy Ghost is a person. That's what the Christians say. The Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, but they are not three persons, but one person. I don't know whether you heard that expression before. But he is a person. This Holy Ghost will come on Mary. How? See, it gives you in your mind. It means you think, how? Like a man and a woman, like a bull and a cow. How? The Almighty will overshadow her. How? No, no, it gives you a mental picture. So I'm suggesting that it gives you a mental picture. You know, how? The Holy Ghost will come on her. We know it's a miracle. We agree it's a miracle. But the language that you are using, the language is down to earth language. The Quran says, Wa kada amran fa innama yakulu lahu kun fayakun. For God to create Jesus without a human father, he says, kun, he says, be and it is. For him, it's just to will it and he comes into being. So I'm asking the Reverend. I said, now, between these two versions, we are both try, trying to say the same thing. We are both trying to give the same message, that he was born miraculously. There's no doubt about that. But I said, which version which would, you, would you prefer to give to your daughter? The Quranic version or the biblical version? We are both trying to say the same thing. He said, he bowed his head down in shame, and he said, he would prefer to give the Quranic version. This is Reverend Dunkers, the head of the Bible Society in Johannesburg. <laughs> you show this to your Christian friends and neighbors, your employers, your employees, and you see what happens. If they start being funny, then I will show you other ways. Then it's the other method. But otherwise, this is how Allah expects us to talk to them, share with them. So the story is that in, the, in these verses, the story is that the mother of Mary, she, she was barren for a long period of time. And she prayed to God. So, oh my Lord, if you give me a child, I'll devote my child for temple services, for your service. I will dedicate her. And God heard her prayer and she became pregnant from her husband. And in time she delivered the child. And the child happened to be a female. And she was disappointed. She had vowed that that child she will dedicate. Imagining, thinking it will be a son, a male. But it happened to be a female. What is she to do? She had vowed. So she buys her time when Mary was big enough that she can look after herself. Her toiletries and, all, toiletries and all that. She takes this child to the temple for handing over. And the priest in the temple of Jerusalem, they're seeing this beautiful child. Everybody wants to be a godfather. You know godfather? That's how the Westerners say, you know, to look after the child as his own. Everyone says, look, I'll look after the child. The other one says, I'll be the godfather. I'll look after the child. And there's competition. So they started casting lots. Head or tail, head or tail. And it came to the turn of Zechariah. Zechariah won the toss. The father of John the Baptist, he won the toss. But in things like this, there's always a dispute. You say, you didn't play fair. You know, you didn't throw the dice nicely. You know? So there was a dispute. So the Quran says, the Quran tells us that, oh Muhammad, you were not there. 
when they cast lots with arrows, as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary, nor was thou with them when they disputed the point. How do you know these things? How does Muhammad know? He is an illiterate man, a man who doesn't know how to read or write. How does he know this? So, Allah gives the answer. This is part of the tidings of the things unseen, which we reveal unto thee, O messenger, by inspiration. This is how he got this knowledge. Whatever is given to him, he's got no choice, he's got to utter them. That Mary, a Jewess, the mother of Jesus, she is a woman chosen above the women of all nations. It doesn't make sense. When the Jews were looking down upon the Arabs for 3,000 years, do you know that? They said Father Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. They had Sarah and Hagar. We, the Jews, they say we are the children of Sarah. The first son through Abraham, Isaac. And from Isaac to Jacob and Jacob to Judas and Judas and his brethren, shh, the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob and all 12 tribes of Israel. And we are the Jews, the chosen people. Coming from this noble ancestry of Abraham through Isaac. Ishmael is the son of Hagar, Bibi Hajra. Ishmael is the first son, and through him, the Arabs. They are cousins. Father Abraham is the father of the Jews as well as the Arabs. But the Jews have been looking down upon the Arabs for 3,000 years that these Arabs are Hagarines. In the literature, they call the Arabs Hagarines, means the children of Hagar, Bibi Hajra. And Islam, they say, is Hagarism. <laughs> the religion of the children of Hagar, of the Arabs. Hagarism. <laughs> These are the titles they give us. The Jews, our cousins. And yet this man, Muhammad, is honoring a Jewess to the skies. Amazing. It's unbelievable. You can't believe. I said, if Muhammad did that job, why did he do such a thing? It's a silly thing, Wallah. It's a silly thing. Hmm? He's offending the Christians and he's offending the Arabs. The Arabs, naturally they feel that another Arab woman might have been a, a likely candidate. Not his own mother, Muhammad's mother, not even his mother, not his wife, not his daughter. When we believe that his daughter Fatima will be the leader of the women of paradise. But no, even her name is not mentioned in this book. Her name is not mentioned. Muhammad's mother's name is not mentioned. Not a single of his wife's names are mentioned. Amazing, this book. So people get puzzled. You see, when they get a book like this, you present them, they are looking for Muhammad, his family history. And you don't find it. You wonder who is his father? You know his father's name is not there. You don't know where he was born. It's not here. Do you know that? Where, who was his father? Who was his mother? Where he was born? Where he died? Nothing, nothing at all. Why? Jesus, his, his enunciation, the good news, is described in two places in the Quran. Two places. Muhammad's birth is not mentioned at all. Muhammad is mentioned five times. Jesus, 25 times. Moses, 136 times. <laughs> no, no, no. This is a very amazing book. The Westerner, see, he just can't seem to grasp. He is looking for a book. We'll tell him once upon a time. He's, he's used to once upon a time syndrome. Everything must be once upon a time. Once upon a time. He's looking for once upon a time. And this book is not a once upon a time. It is not. It is a very concentrated book. Therefore, you need an index. And the topics that tickle you, my brothers, the brothers and sisters, you look up those topics that will make interesting reading for you. Get it. Get it as soon as possible. This book. So now, we Muslims are made to believe that Jesus is one of the mightiest messengers of God. That he is the Messiah, the Messiah. Translated, Christ. And in verse 45, we started with 42, 45. It says, again, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, in Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu. That Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from Him. The Christians say, Jesus is the word of God. The Quran says, a word from Him. Ismuhul Masih. His name will be the Messiah, Christ. Masih in Arabic, Messiah in Hebrew, 
translated into Greek, Christos. And Christos is too much a word to say, so they cut off the os and left with Christ. Christ means the anointed one. Messiah means the anointed one. Messiah means the anointed one. They all are trying to say the same thing. Ismuhul Masih, who is of Numariyama, Jesus the son of Mary, Wajihan fi dunya wal akhira, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. Wa minal mukarrabin, and of the company of those nearest to God. The Christian says, Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God. The Quran says, he's in the company of those nearest to God. We tell our Christian brothers that, look, we accept what you say. He's sitting on the right hand of God, but not geographically, not physically, because God is not a physical being sitting on a huge throne. And Jesus Christ sitting on his right hand side on a stool. No, to me, it makes no sense. This almighty who permeates the whole universe, on beside him, a little flea, a term, what is it, an, an atom, you know, and what, 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 are, what are, can I describe? A small piece of bacteria, you know, on a stool. Does it make, what honor is this? No, no, no. So we, we Eastern people, when we speak about the right hand, we mean a place of honor. My right hand man is not necessarily sitting on my right hand side. He can be sitting on my left hand side. He can be sitting behind me. He can be in front of me. My right hand man. I mean, anything I want to discuss, I have a problem, I want to consult, I consult my right hand man. But my right hand man will be sitting on my left hand side. No, no. This is, this is the figure of speech to say a person a position, who occupies a very important position in my estimation. That's what it, it means right now. So we say right hand, yes, sitting on the right hand of God, not physically, not geographically, but in status. He doesn't have to sit on the right hand side. So now these are difference of seeing at the same thing through different light. You don't have to accept our interpretation. You, they don't have to. But we say, now look, this sounds more reasonable to say that he occupies a very, very important position. And what you call him nasa. He will speak to the people in childhood and in maturity. And he shall be of the company of the righteous. This is Jesus. He will speak in childhood and in maturity. And he will be in the company of the righteous. This is again confirmed in the Quran. The statement is made in chapter 3. In chapter 19, it's being confirmed. That he spoke to the people as an infant in his mother's arms. The very first miracle of Jesus in the Holy Bible. You find that in, in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2. That Jesus and his disciples and his mother were invited at the marriage feast at Cana. Cana is the name of the place. Marriage feast at Cana. The very first miracle of Jesus, according to the Holy Bible. He is invited at the marriage feast at Cana. And the people run short of wine. So his mother comes to him. John, John, chapter 2, I'm reading to you. His mother comes to him as a son. Look, these people have run short of wine. We now, I know, in the back of our mind, so I know you've got mysterious powers, you know. You can help them to solve the problem. This is the plea made by his mother. And Jesus responds. He says, woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? Woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Now, if you don't want to do a job, man, there's a nicer way of telling your mother. He says, mom, look, I'm tired. <laughs> Leave me out. You don't have to address your mother as woman. That's the word is used for a prostitute. No, no, no. This same book now, the word woman he uses for a prostitute. That woman caught, caught in the act of adultery. In the Bible, you read John chapter 8. A woman. So the Jews bring this woman to Jesus. They says, Master, we caught this woman in the act. What must we do to her? Actually, they're trying to trap him. They're not looking for an answer. If he says, let her go, man, 
They said, this man is not a man of God. Look, the book of Leviticus. In our Torah, it tells us that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. Is he a Messiah? Can he be the man of God? He says, let her go. He's rejected. If he says, stone her, they'll kill her. And adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire. So the cashier said, why did you kill this woman? He said, our Messiah says so. So he's beaten the devil in the deep. He's in conflict with the government. The laws of the state. Either way he loses. Heads I win, tails you lose. So what does he do? He's also a Jew. Look, these are Jews, are geniuses. I'm telling you. No, no, they are our cousins. You know, they always beat us. You know that. They always have got one on us. You know, you go into an agreement hmm, that, you know, we resolution was a 342 or 424. Hmm, this is now they're going to uh, let go the, the occupied territories for peace. Occupied territories. So now they said, right, we move this to, for you to implement your, your part of it. He said, no, you haven't given up the occupied territory. He said, no, we didn't say the occupied territory. In the resolution, he said, occupied territory. So this piece here, is, the, is it not occupied territory? So yes. Is the means the whole thing that was concerned in 1967. No, 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 we didn't talk about that. We said occupied territory. We didn't say the occupied territory. And we lost. We lose. I'm telling you. No, they beat us. They beat us. Our cousins, Allah has gifted them. See, we have to learn now something from them to counteract their machinations. It says, If you know the language of a people, you can avoid their vials and their machinations. We don't. We are not equipped. So really to give battle, an intellectual battle to the Jew. We are not equipped yet. However, that's besides the point. So, what they say? I've drifted off. Look, by the way, on Friday we had this meeting here. Our chairman was saying that tonight's meeting, four to six weeks' time, we'll get the videotape. We said something like that for tonight's meeting. This meeting on Friday, four days' time. Tapes are available outside. Four days. They're here. Pick them up. Pick them up. They're outside. I think there's a price for you to pay. Get them. Of the Friday's meeting. Um, Easter, a Muslim viewpoint. What makes Good Friday good? You remember the talk. The tape is available outside. So, our, we say, the first miracle of Jesus was to turn water into, ah, that woman. That woman. What is Jesus to do? So he says, let him who is free from sin cast the first stone. Those who are sinless among you, let them start stoning. And so saying, he started, he sat in, on the ground and started scribbling in the sand. No, no, I'm reading the Bible to you. He started scribbling in the sand. He said, doodling, doodling in the sand. So I'm asking the Christians, what was he doodling? Nobody knows. I'm telling you, in my life, I haven't come across a Christian who can tell me what this Jesus was doodling. I'm telling you, you ask any Christian, what was he doodling? Nobody knows. I say, I tell you, my theory. I may be wrong. I says he was doodling the names of the people who were watching over his shoulder. It's human nature. We are inquisitive. When somebody is writing, we want to know what he's writing. So, these accusers of that woman, they're watching what he's writing. He's writing combination of names. This guy, watching over his shoulder, his John, he has something to do with a woman called Elizabeth, has been committing adultery. So he writes John and Elizabeth. The guy says, this guy knows about me. Shh, out he goes. He knows about me. Next guy is Matthew. So Matthew and Mary say, he knows about me. This bloody rubbish, he knows about me too. Out he goes. 
everybody who's looking over his shoulder through prophetic, prophetic knowledge, he is able to put down those combinations. You, whoever you are, you are, a, you are Smith. I said, the Smith fellow has something to do with, with Rosetta or whatever. <laughs> Everybody is hitting everybody for a sixer. That doodling. He's, with that doodling, he's hitting them for a sixer. You know, like Don Bradman, you had one here. MCC. You remember? Oh no, that was in Melbourne. I'll just tell you something amusing about Don Bradman. I was young. I was a schoolboy. I used to read in the newspapers, it's MCC versus England. They're having it out in England. MCC, MCC. Say MCC, Muslim Cricket Club. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, by God, look, I, I'm not trying to be clever. I'm telling you, I didn't know Melbourne. I didn't know this Australia and all that I knew nothing about. As a schoolboy, I'm reading Don Bradman, MCC, MCC. I said, I, I favor them. I'm sorry. I want them to win. You know why? It's a Muslim Cricket Club. <laughs> So, he hit everybody for a sixer, like Don Bradman. Now he looks up and he's asking the woman, he says, woman, where are thine accusers? The guys who are accusing you of adultery, where are they? He says, no, sir, they are no more, they're gone. So he said, go, sin no more. Because those guys were out to catch him out. Jesus is telling you all are adulterers. You all deserve to be stoned to death. And you are convicting this woman. And if this woman was guilty, you caught her in the act. Where was the man? Where was the man? You sexist. Where was man? You caught her in the act. Where? What was the woman doing? What was the man doing? Where is that man? No, no, no. It's only the woman you are after. You are sexist. So go for it. Just because they are poor women, you want to victimize her. So I says, now this is how, this is how the miracle. So, Jesus Christ, he tells his mother, she, what have I got to do with thee? He calls, woman, woman, why, where are thine accusers? Same word he uses for his mother. Woman, I can't believe it. The title you use for a prostitute, you use that same title for your mother. In your language, you Jews, I say, haven't you got a word called mother? Um, in Arabic, same thing in Hebrew. In English, it says mother. In Gujarati, it says ma. In Urdu, it says ma. Or it says amma. Man, in every language. In the African, it says mama. It says, man, every language has got a respectful way of addressing your mothers. Not woman. You don't call your mother woman, do you? Huh? You lout? You barbarian? What? You call your mother woman? You deserve to be stoned. And Jesus said that honor your father and your mother. This is at the words of Jesus. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, whosoever dishonoreth his father or his mother, let him die the death. He should die. Kill him. This is what Jesus said. And he himself doing that? I said, no. Jesus would never do that. The Quran comes to his rescue. It says, Wabarram bi walidati. In Surah Maryam, chapter 19, it says, Wabarram bi walidati. He was kind to his mother. And not overbearing or miserable. The Quran exonerates him. He wasn't like that. This is, I don't know, friend or foe. How they made to put these words inside, we don't know. But when he was persuaded by his mother, he turned water into wine. That's what you are told. John chapter 2. At the marriage feast has Cana. He turned water into wine. And since then, wine has flowed like water in Christendom. In Christendom. In America, 45 million alcoholics, 45 million alcoholics, they call them problem drinkers. <laughs> Every nation has got funny, funny ways of calling them. Heavy drinkers, problem drinkers, not drunkards. You don't call them drunkards. You call them alcoholics. They're sick people, poor people. They're sick. Wine has flowed like water in Christendom. The first miracle of Jesus in the Quran now. That was the first miracle of Jesus in the Bible. In the Quran, chapter 19. Chapter 19, Surah Maryam. 
You know, there is a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, meaning chapter Mary. Who's Mary? Who's this Mary? Mother of Muhammad? No, no. It's the mother of Jesus Christ. In honor of her name, there is a chapter enshrined in the Quran, chapter 19, as Surah Maryam. I said, such an honor is not to be found given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, even in your Bible. Do you know that? You have no such book as Mary in your Bible. This is the... <laughs> this is the King James Version, the Protestant Bible, 66 books. It starts with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and, blah, 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 and then Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul, James. Mary is not one of them. Mary is not one of them. In the Roman Catholic Bible, same, same. Mary is not one of them. In the Quran, you have a chapter called Maryam. Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. Ayah number 23. That after the birth of the child, the circumstance is being peculiar. The Quran says she had retired to a remote place in the east. After the birth of the child, she and she comes to her village, carrying the infant in her arms. It says, "Fa'atat bihi qawmaha tahmiluhu." At length, she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. Alu, they said, Ya Maryam, lakad jiti shayan fariya. Says, Oh Mary, truly an amazing thing has thou brought. They are shocked, amazed. Because Mary, according to our understanding, she was not married. There is no place for Joseph the carpenter in the Quran or in Islam. We have no place for him. This is, Oh Mary, truly an amazing thing has thou brought. Ya Ukta Haruna, O sister of Harun, brother of Moses. Ya Ukta Haruna, ma kana abu kimra asawim, wa ma kanat ummu kibagiya. Says, your father was not a man of evil, nor your mother a woman and chaste. How is it that you have brought this illegitimate child into the world? We know you are not married. Your father was a goodly man. You come from a noble ancestry. Your mother was a virtuous woman, chaste woman. How is this that you brought this child without a husband? Insinuating that the child is illegitimate. What is she to do? Can she tell them, he says, you know, I heard voices. And, you know, I became pregnant. And I delivered the baby. Were these people in the mood to listen to her? To accept her explanation? If your sister, your dear sister, she tells you one day, she is very virtuous, sincere, religious. Your sister. She tells you, says, Brother, you know I was hearing some voices and I'm now carrying a baby. You know, it's the spirit, you know, the Holy Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. You know, we're always praying to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. You know, He has done it to me. I'm carrying His baby now. Would you believe her? Huh? In the absence of your father, he's gone for some time, and your mother tells you, He says, You know, son, you know, I had a dream about your dad, and now I'm carrying a baby. You believe her, your mother, your sister? <laughs> Were the Jews in a mood to listen to her explanation? No. What can she do? What can she do? The Quran says, For Asharat Ilay, but she pointed to the babe. Let's talk to him, ask him. She knew this is no ordinary child. Ask him. So they say, Said, how can we talk to one who is a child in the cradle? How can we talk to him? We are asking you. And by a miracle, Jesus spoke from his mother's arm, says the Quran. Said, Most certainly I am the servant of Allah. I am the messenger of Allah. He has given me revelation. And he has made me a prophet. As an infant, he defended his mother from his critics. Those who were having throwing aspersions as his mother, he defended his mother. The first miracle of Jesus in the Quran is that, that as an infant, he defended his mother. Now I say, take the choice. 
you prefer that miracle where he turned water into wine as the first miracle or this miracle as an infant he defended his mother you, your choice is yours the muslim is only presenting and said look this is our 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 concept of what jesus is and he is the messiah masi the quran said i read it to chapter verse 45 chapter 3 سبحان قال للملائكه يا مريم ان الله يبشرك بكلمه منه God gives you glad tidings of a word from him his muhul masih his name will be the messiah christ his name will be the christ we muslims believe that jesus was the christ we have no other christ have we have we muslims got another christ no the quran says He is Muhul Masih. His name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. And the Bible tells us, the Holy Bible tells us. He gives us the test. How do we know a true prophet from a false prophet? The first epistle of John. There is a Gospel of Saint John. That's one thing. And there is an epistle of John. First epistle of John, chapter four, verse one. It says. beloved john is addressing beloved believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of god for many false prophets have gone out into the world i'm only reading the christian bible the first epistle of john chapter 4 verse 1 beloved you people my beloved brothers and sisters it says believe not every spirit Don't believe every Tom Dick and Harry what he comes and tells you don't accept it believe not every spirit but try the spirits whether they are of god for many false prophets have gone out into the world the false prophet is a false spirit the true prophet is a true spirit the word prophet and spirit are used synonymously here don't believe any spirit but try them whether they are of god for many false prophets have gone out into the world how do you know a false prophet he has got a false spirit How do you know a true prophet is got a true spirit? That's how you. If he's got the true spirit, he's a true prophet. He's got a false spirit, he's a false prophet. How do we know the true from the false? Verse two. He says, "The prophet that confesseth that Jesus is the Christ is of God." Your Bible, your Bible. He said, "The spirit means the prophet that says that Jesus is the Christ. He has come in the flesh. That is come is born on earth. He is a true prophet." the prophet that confesseth that jesus is the christ is of god i said why don't you apply this test to muhammad <laughs> not only muhammad said so but 1 billion and 200 million muslims of the world 100% of us we believe that jesus was born miraculously that he is the christ He gave life back to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. And now, yet they consider us to be the antichrist. What we have to do? We have to educate them, inform them. But before we do that, we have to educate ourselves. And to educate ourselves, we need this book. Imperative that every Muslim you have this book. And if you can afford to have two, get two and present them to your Christian friends, your neighbors, give it to them. Well, like give it to them. Your employers, give it to them. Your employees, give it to them. It says, look, this is the Holy Quran. Please respect it. This is how we use this. When we are in a state of impurity, we don't touch this book. So you know, be in a state of taharat, purity, and wash your hands before you use this book. Give it to him. Give it to him or to her. and let allah do the rest let allah speak to him to his heart and mind you can't do a better job use allah's kalam his words let allah do the talking and you can't find a better advocate than allah wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alamin thank you shaykh did that Question time will start very shortly. Uh, basically, after I've explained the simple rules, for the sisters, for all the ladies, there's a microphone down here. If you could please queue along that aisle there, 
Be careful when you're coming down the front because there are a few leads around. We don't want an accident. The same thing applies to the men. There's a microphone over there for you. If you could queue over in that area there, it will make things a lot easier for everybody. The rules for the questions are quite simple. You ask the question to me, I'll pass it on to the Sheikh. We want questions. In fact, we welcome them. And if the Christians want to come down, they're welcome to come down and ask because the message is addressed particularly to you and I'm sure you've got questions. When you ask your question, please try to keep within, say, about a minute of time. If you take too long, it means the people behind you can't get their questions in. And inshallah, we'll try to answer everyone's questions tonight. When I say questions, I also mean questions. The lecture has ended. Please don't attempt to give another lecture. By the same token, if you wish to give a sermon, St Andrews is next door. First question, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. My name is Ibrahim Fahmi. If you can come a bit closer yeah. to the microphone, please. Um, I would like to ask um, Sheikh Ahmadi that how old he is first, <laughs> if that's not a problem. That's all right, keep going. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, a convert, an Australian convert asked me um, uh, that he needs to learn Arabic before uh, to needs to learn Arabic before he can read the Quran and uh, he asked me this question I said um, if you read the, the Quran with the translation I think I think uh, it will be easier than reading learning Arabic um, you know and I'd, I'd like to get his point of view please because I couldn't answer him uh, very well thank you Shay? We have to confess, I myself, I don't know Arabic. I'm telling you honestly. You see, I know a few words of Arabic. When I go among the Arabs, if I want water, it says ma, ma, moya. I know the word means water. But I can't say, can you please give me a glass of water that I can say. But I can say ma, ma, moya, moya. And the guy knows that I want water. <laughs> he tells He tells me, I said, Tayyab, Alhamdulillah, and my Arab, Arabic ends there. But look, I see that it doesn't debar me from understanding Islam. I understand the Quran through a translation. When you listen to me that I'm able to read the Arabic and give you the translation, it's not that I know the language, but because I, as what I was suggesting to my sisters, I said, learn the verses in Arabic and learn the meaning, memorize it. What I'm telling other people, I do it myself. I memorize the verse with the meaning. So I'm able to quote you with the meaning. That is all. So, Wala taqulu thalasa. So don't say trinity. I memorize the meaning. I don't know the Arabic. I memorize the meaning. In tahu khairal lakum. So this is stop it. It will be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahum wahid. For your Allah is one Allah. He is not three in one. Now, it gives the impression that I'm a scholar of Arabic and English. No, I'm bluffing my way through. Please, please be kind to me. You may have guessed by the familiar accent that I'm a convert. I don't read Arabic either. And the message is still there and it's still beautiful. Okay. We have a sister who's plucked up the courage. Sister, your question? I'm a convert too, and um, I come from an Arab country. And every time you have an argument with a Christian, they tell you, um, "What does the ayat says? Salamun uh, alayya, yawma wulitu wa yawma amutu wa yawma abatu hayya." That means um, Jesus born and he's, you know, dying and you know he's gonna raise back up, and that's what um, Easter was for. Um, so how can you answer them back when it says Salamun alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma abathu hayya So when did he die and that's what they argument about all the time Thank you A Palestinian 
Arab Christian missionary by the name of Anish Roche. He, he posed this question to me in the Royal Albert Hall in London. He's an Arab. He's boasting about his knowledge of Arabic. He's an Arab. I am not an Arab. I'm a Hindi, an Indian. And born into a Muslim home and came into contact with this translation and this book. And I speak and I deliver messages what I, as I understand. So this Christian missionary, a Palestinian Arab, he quoted this ayah. So the Quran says, and in his own pronunciation, a real Arab. Does it contradict itself in as much as it says? Okay. <laughs> so he's asking me, he said, the Quran says that peace is on me. That's in the Quran, chapter 19. So peace is on me. The day that I was born, the day that I died, and the day that I shall be raised to life again. So here it is in the Quran. He says, Christ died. So what have you to say, Mr. Dida? So I stood up, and I know these few words, only a few words. So I said, you see, you, what you're doing, you're mistranslating. Wasalamun alayya. You translated right. So peace is on me, Jesus says. Wasalamun alayya. Yawma wulitu. The day that I was born. Wayawma amutu. The day that I die. Not died, not died, the day that I died, the day that I die. Die, you know, part in the future tense. The day that I die, and the day that I shall be raised to life again. <laughs> that is the correct translation. Thank you, sister. My question has been answered too. I see that but uh, our sisters are still shy and it looks as though the Christians are still uh, letting the message sink in. We'll go to this brother here. Assalamu alaikum. Um, Wa alaikum salam. Thank you very much for your speech. Again, it was good. Um, in your other speeches of Christ and Islam, you've given us examples how we Muslims follow the example of Christ. I found another one which I haven't heard you say before. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, it says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members shall perish than for your whole body to cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. I'm asking if, why are the Christians attacking us for cutting the hand when Jesus is telling him to do that? You see, my brother, my son, the Christians don't really believe that the Bible is the word of God. Everything is there for, for, for adornment, for, you know, for mystification. The things that Jesus said, no Christian is prepared to do that. Beautifully put, what you are saying now, this is what Jesus said, that if, if you offend one of these little ones in any way, you abuse them in any way, that person should be put to death. And we find there are, at the present moment, there are court case, cases going on in America for priests abusing choir boys. There are claims to the tune of $500 million, and by the turn of this century, it'll go to $1 billion claims for sodomizing choir boys in the churches. The cases, I got, I got cutting, I didn't know I would have brought it along, I'll show you. So they don't really believe. They don't really believe in these things. Jesus truly said, if the eye offends you, cast it out. If this eye is going to make you to go to hell, he's telling you, do not look upon a woman to lust after her. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. You're already guilty. You, my disciples, you, are on a higher level than the Jews. The Jew was guilty only if he committed adultery. And that punishment was stoning to death, according to the Old Testament, the law of God. And Jesus didn't come to change the law. Because in Matthew, again, I think chapter 5, verse 17, he says, 
think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do shall be called great. Where are the Christians who follow the laws and the commandments? Universally, they reject the laws and the commandments. The, Christ, the Christian says he's not bound by the law. He says he's living in the grace. He is living in the grace. They are not bound by the law. Because he said, if you keep, according to Jesus, you are worthless rubbish. Even if you break one of these least commandments. You are not his follower. You are not his follower. He says, he's not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. The way I pray, you pray. The way I am circumcised, you must be circumcised. The, day I, the way I eschew the flesh of the swine, you do the same. No, 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 you don't want to follow him. We Muslims, we are the true Christians in that we are following Jesus Christ. No, but now when we say that, the Christians say we are attacking them. We are attacking them. I say, I'm only presenting to you the cases in daylight. It's a daylight. It's an open secret. What's going on? In the churches, what's going on? The priests, what are they doing? The Anglican Church has just written a new Ten Commandments. Do you know that? A new Ten Commandments, no, the new Ten Commandments for vicars. Vicars. Vicars means priests. How they must behave when the parishioners come along for solace and advice. I'm reading them to you. I'm reading to you. Oh, I wish I had brought it along. It's in my hotel room now. Hmm? A new Ten Commandments. It says, you must not entertain young women late at night. Number one. <laughs> no, no, that's number one. You do not entertain or allow the, your parishioner to come and see you, young woman, late at night. That's number one. First commandment. So I'm asking, what do you mean by young woman? What do you mean by young? How young is young? Huh? The woman of 50, is she old? The woman of 60, is she old? What do you take me for? I'm 78. You think I'm old? No, no, no. <laughs> no, honestly speaking, honestly speaking, I am 78, my wife is 75, and I tell you, we are not old. <laughs> I tell my wife, I tell my wife jokingly, I tell my wife jokingly, I said, look, you are old, I'm also old, you know? but you see, let me get some, somebody young, meaning, get another wife. I said, let me get somebody young to help you. She, say, she says, I'll kill her. I said, no, no, no. I said, look, it's not her fault. I will bring her to help you. She said, I'll kill her. I said, why kill her? If anybody has to be killed, it's me. You know, I'm bringing her. She says, no, I'll kill her. So I said, I can't afford a murder in the house. So I'm satisfied. But now, <laughs> how young is young? You are as young as you feel. You are as young as you think. You are as young as you feel. <laughs> and late at night, I said, what do you mean late at night? How late is late? You think you can't do wrong things five o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> huh? Damn it all, you have to wait till midnight? Huh? You are a priest and this poor woman, and they said, now how you sit, you must behave. You must sit. You know, when the woman comes to you for solace, you don't sit, you know, with your legs stretched out on the sofa. And <laughs> no, no, you must sit with all due respect. And the lighting must be correct. The lighting must be right. <laughs> New Ten Commandments. New Ten Commandments. After 2,000 years of Christianity, today you have to learn how to behave with women who are not your wives and daughters.
went by African people in South Africa. Every tribe, Zulu, Kosa, Chwana, every African tribe south of the Zambezi, they have what they call Shonipa, respect for women. They don't intermingle in the primitive society. As Christians, of course, they have the Bible in the hand and they take everybody's wives and daughters to the dance, as Christians. But this, this primitive African, he has respect for women. What he knows, before the white man came, he had it and he still got it. Today, after 2,000 years, you have to be given new Ten Commandments, how to behave with women in a, of your church. But this is what it is. You are not reading your Bible. What the Bible says, don't offend this, one of these little ones. You, this, it's better for you that they put a millstone around your neck and drown you. It means kill them, kill them. Next question, the lady over here. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you um, if you can just talk briefly um, about how they say that a man can have four wives. Can you just, um, because it does sound very sexist, so I just was wondering if you can talk about that. <laughs> it's a little bit off the subject. The lady would like to know how can a man have four wives. I think it's a little bit off the subject. You'll answer, okay. Well, the Sheikh will answer you, even though it is a little bit off the topic. <laughs> now, this is a pet question. You know, when the Arabs, when they go to America or to Britain, the Westerner says, you come from Saudi Arabia? I said, yes. So how many wives have you got? <laughs> how many wives have you got? So my friend, a bakka, not a bakka, Karim, Karim Bin Laden, a young man, he says, you see, when he goes to America, when the Americans pose this question to him, he says, he says, he says, look, I got only one wife. But this is a solution to your problem. This polygamy is a solution to your problem. You see, sir, you have a problem. You have in your country 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, there will be still 7.8 million women who will not be able to get husbands. And we know every man will never marry. Man gets cold feet for so many reasons. You know that? I meet a young man. How old are you? He says, 35. Are you married? He says, no. I said, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Do you need a doctor? Shall I take you to the doctor to find out? You know? <laughs> what's wrong with you? Come on. He says, there is a friend of ours. You know, he's got a daughter, good-looking, well-educated, good family. Come. It's right. It's right. I take him along, and when he comes to the crunch, he finds some excuse to back out. He knows the reason. He won't tell me. That may be at the back of his mind. He won't make the grade, man. You know, he has done so many abuses. He's finished. That guy, so he finds excuse for not doing that. Man, man, man. Man gets cold feet for so many reasons. But move him you know, somebody to give them protection. They don't mind a husband. They don't mind a husband. Even if they're frigid, they're cold. They don't mind somebody to give them protection. I'm telling you, this is the psychology of women. But we know every man will not get it. If, even if every man got married, there'll be 7.8 million women without husbands in America. And of the manpower they have there, there are 25 million sodomites. You call them gays. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. Then your prison population, 98% are males. Your prison population, 98% are males. I said, your problem is getting compounded. Islam offers you a solution. You laugh at us. I said, the laugh is on you. The laugh is on you. Islam says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours. But if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religious book on earth. The only religious book on earth which has the statement, marry only one, is the Quran. There is no other book, religious book on earth which has such a statement. The Quran says, marry only one, if you can't do this. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Gentlemen, over here. Assalamu alaikum, Mr. Didad. Wa alaikum salam. In 1992, I had a brief experience with some Jehovah's Witness. They came to my house continuously. Alhamdulillah, I was introduced to your um, videos. They came to my house for three days, day after day after day. First, he was alone, then with his wife, and the third day with his son. Alhamdulillah, I have, you have advised me, I have done my homework. Um, chapter 3, verse 61, Al-Imran, it says, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهْ لِلَى اللَّهِ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةُ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ When I have read that verse, uh, believe me, he said, do you want God to curse me? And he didn't stay away from my house for three days or three nights. For three years, Mr. Didat, alhamdulillah. Can you explain that verse in English to, to my brothers and sisters in Islam? This verse, I think the occasion of the revelation is that the Christian deputation had come from Najran. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad accommodated them in the Masjid al Nabawi, in the Mosque of the Prophet. At that time, a very humble structure, you know, mud walls and thatch roof. They lived in this Masjid for three days and three nights. They ate there, they discussed the religion there, and they slept there. And when Sunday came, it happened to be, Abu Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he offered them the, the masjid for their prayers. But now, during the course of this discussion, it ended off badly. They started accusing the Prophet of lying, lying, that you know what you say is a lie, it's a lie. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, that we must invoke the curse of God upon him who lies. So saying, he said, look, tomorrow morning, you bring your families and we take our families in the open air and we invoke the curse of God upon him who lies. Who is talking lies? So, next morning, the Prophet ﷺ was seen with, with Ali, Hazrat Ali, Bibi Fatima and little Hassan and Hussein. They're walking out to the open field outside Medina and the Christians, they made a vanishing trick. They disappeared. So now, this was the occasion. This was the occasion. Now, you used it and it produced some effect, alhamdulillah. But there are other ways also of dealing with them. That, uh, you know, one thing, I don't know what you, you did. Whether you got the telephone numbers, those witnesses, the home address, did you get that? Did you get the home address of your visitors? You right. had them for three days, you say. They That's came. Right. That's right, because we continue talking, so they came day after day. After right, day. right, right. But did you take the house number and the telephone number? Of them? Did you? Of their house number? Yes, no. and the telephone number? No, because I have already communicated with them about Islam. No, no, no. So That's no, the trouble. When these people come along, man, first thing, they come into a house. What is your name? Take it down. Your telephone number? Take it down. Right. So now, the guy doesn't turn up, you go to his house. <laughs> and, and, pester the life out of them, I'm telling you. Until they tell you, next time you darken my door, I'll put a bullet through you. <laughs> I think we might go to a question over here. It's probably better. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Hamza. Uh, my question, uh, Sheikh Ahmed. Sheikh Ahmed say, uh, Jesus is, is not dead. We know about it. But who was nailed to Christ? And uh, Christian people praise for who? For what or what? Could you, did you understand the question? Look, brother, we have a little bit of trouble understanding you. Stand back from the microphone a little bit and repeat your question, please. No, don't laugh. He's got a serious question. Can you just stand a little bit back and... I want to ask a question. Who was 
may lead to cross. Okay. He'd like to know who was nailed to the cross. Because I may say, Jesus is not dead. We know about it. Muslim people, he know Jesus is not dead, not the cross. But who come and nailed it to cross? And Christian people pray for who? For wood or what? <laughs> Do you understand that? The, the gentleman would like to know the Christian people say Jesus was nailed to the cross, Muslims say Jesus was not. Who was nailed to the cross? And if Jesus was not nailed to the cross, who do Christians pray to? See, the Muslim position is very clear. In Surah Maida, chapter 5, 157, Allah says, Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. And they said in boast that they killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. In answer to that, Allah says, Wama kataluhu, wama salabuhu. That they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. Walakin lahum. But it was made to appear to them so. And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. For a surety, they killed him not. But Allah took him up to himself. Now that's what I believe. But now, but now when the Christian comes along, and he said Christ died for his sins. Then I says now, Allah says, ask him for his burhan. And he produces burhan, the Bible. Then I deal with the Bible according to what he says. And I prove to him that whatever you say, even if it happened, Christ didn't die. And so there was no crucifixion. And that I was proving to you on Friday. Were you here on Friday? Friday night? Good Friday, were you here? Were you here on Good Friday? No, no. Then you buy this tape and it'll give you the whole story. This tape outside, you buy this. Thank you. Next question from the lady. Um, I was just wanting to know um, where these new Ten Commandments have come from. Because I actually attend an Anglican church and I'm not aware that the commandments have changed. As far as I know, we follow the same commandment, same Ten Commandments as what the Muslims do. I was just wanting to know um, where this has come about and um, when it's supposed to be introduced, because I, I haven't heard anything of it yet. Those Ten Commandments came from the Anglican Church and I have the newspaper cutting of this from my local newspaper in Durban and if you, don't, if you like, you can come to my hotel and I will show it to you. I will be able to show it to you. That is coming from the Anglican Church. Is the church itself are mooting these ten new Ten Commandments. Not we, not the ordinary people, but the hierarchy of the church, they formulated these new Ten Commandments. I have that Newspaper cutting, original newspaper, I would like to show it to you. Could you tell me um, what newspaper it was from? Was this from a newspaper in Australia? Or no, no, in England. In England. In Eng well, it starts from there, then it will come to Australia as well, I take it. <laughs> Next question. Good evening, Mr. Bidard. Uh, before I ask question, I'd uh, like to say a few words, if it's possible. Be careful. <laughs> no, no, no not that right. I heard anybody. 
if I heard, uh, first of all, tonight it's a very big moment of my life. I heard some words which I wouldn't believe I would heard. Uh, if I, 10 years ago, or say 15 years ago, spoke with the majority of Muslims, I would have, if I asked them, do you believe Jesus, in Jesus Christ? The answer would be no, no majority. That means the knowledge was minimum. Shh. Tonight, I say it's a big part of my life because I heard something different. But now, we're asking the answer how to believe. Same as we get married. We get married, but our strength in our marriage is our children. That means if we get married and if we have Christ in our life, we're asking what have should got, we have. Have you got a question? Or is yes, this a, just or is finish, this a in a, finish in a minute. The answer is without being baptized, we can believe we don't have Christ in our life. Thank you. Now, the question is, in Quran, where Quran in Surah 19, chapter 33 and 34 says, Peace on me the day I was born, and the day I die, and the day I shall be raised alive. Such was Jesus, son of Mary. Can you give me the answer of that? Because they said, he be raised alive. If he's raised, he'll come back again. That Quran says, not me. Okay, well, thank you for your sermon first. You're welcome. You managed to slip that one past me. That question's already been answered, but I think we have to get the point home. So, Sheikh, can you explain again? We believe that God took up Jesus alive. He's still alive. And he's going to come back alive. And he's going to die like everybody else. And he will be resurrected like everybody else. So, peace is on me. The day that I was born, you know when he was born, the day that I die, after his second coming, he is going to die. Everybody must taste of death. Anybody, everybody. Everybody must taste of death, including Jesus. So he dies like everybody else. And everybody, when he's resurrected, he will also be resurrected from the dead. That's what it means. Can I, can I ask another thing? But, no, one question only, I'm sorry. Next question. I just want to ask um, the Sheikh that um, I'm a, I converted to Islam and he said earlier that in the Quran it says to obey your parents. Well, I'm disobeying my parents because I converted. Um, I'd just like to know if I'm sinning and if I am, what do I do to make it right? I take it you're concerned that you're disobeying your parents by converting and what can you do to make it right? Is that your question? Okay, that takes the wisdom of Solomon, I think. In the Quran, the solution to your problems is given. In the chapter I mentioned, Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. In that chapter, there is a story of Abraham. Abraham, he was a man of God. He had discovered the way to God, a right concept of God. But his father was an idol worshipper. And now you read the story. Chapter 19, verse 51. It says, And narrate in the book the story of Abraham. He was a man of truth, a prophet. Is qala li abihi is behold he said to his father, Ya Abati, O oh my father, Lima Ta'budu, Mala Yasmau, Wala Yupsuru, Wala Yugni and Kashaya. Said, Why do you worship that which can neither hear nor see nor profit you nothing? 
يا أبتي أو ما فاذا إني كجاني من العلم ما لم يأتك فاتبعني أهدك سيرات سوية said oh my father knowledge has come to me which has not reached you so follow me and I will show you that a way that is even and straight ya abati oh my father and again ya abati oh my father four times every verse begins with oh my father oh my father oh my with compassion and feeling for his father trying to save him from hellfire the father he speaks in arrogance he says, Qala araghibun antan alihati ya Ibrahim. He says, does thou hate my gods of Abraham? He says, get out of my sight for a good long while. I'll st- otherwise I'll stone you to death. Now, the response of Abraham to that. And the commentary on that is to be found in this book, chapter 19, verse 51. That how a dutiful son ought to, to reason and be, be compassionate towards his unbelieving parents. Unbelieving parents. You love them, you respect them, you treat them well. The only thing when it comes to matters between you and God, they have no control. It's between your belief and unbelief, then you have to reject. In, on that respect, you reject their advice, the, 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 their force of the persuasion, the pressure on you. You reject it. But even then, you treat them as your parents, your father and your mother. When it comes to religious matters, they do not come in between you and God. That is what the Quran says. I think you have this Quran. You have a Quran like this by Yusuf Ali. You have a Quran, chapter 19, verse 51, 52, 53, 54, 55. And you see the commentary, and he'll tell you the exact position that you must occupy. When it comes to faith, nobody comes in between you and God. Nobody. Not even your father or your mother. But you still love them, and you respect them. That's what the Quran says. I can tell you right now, sister, you're not alone. And there are a few people there. I can see familiar faces who probably want to say the same thing. We'll go to this brother over here. Sheikh Ahmed, my question about the miracle of Jesus and the connection between the miracle of Eve and the miracle of Adam. Eve was created from Adam, a woman from man, and Jesus, a man from a woman without opposites. My impression always when I see the miracle of Jesus, it comes to me all straight the miracle of Eve and the Adam, and the connection and the wisdom of Al-Adl subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that equality? As I created from a man, a woman, same I created a woman from a man. Can you comment to me, please? Thank you. Just a minute, brother. Are you asking as a Muslim or as a Christian, brother? I think it's a Muslim, isn't it? Muslim. I wish you were a Christian. <laughs> now I say that because now you see this is it's taking me into a field. You know, I'm down to a solid ground. Everything that I talk is solid. You want to take me into an airy uh, space. Now, if you were a Christian, I would have told you that, look, all these splitting hairs is nothing compared in your book. We don't want to know. Where does it matter to us? With regards to Jesus and Adam, Allah says, Inna masala Isa, inna Allahi kamasali Adama. The similitude of Jesus in the sight of God is that of Adam. Khalakahum in turabin, he created him from dust. ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ And he said, be, and he was. So, if Jesus, as the Christians claim, is God, and the begotten Son of God, because he had no father, Adam would be a greater God, because he had no father and no mother. But, 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 the Christian says, but you see, Adam was created from dust. This is right. 
So there is another character in your Bible, I'll tell the Christian. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 1, who is greater than Jesus and Adam. Do you know that? I'm asking the Christian, do you know in your Bible, there is another character. Hebrews, book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 1. And that person, I think the people gave me the answer. I have some books here to give away. Who is that person? No. You, you give me the answer. Who is that person greater than Jesus in his, in his birth, in his living, in his parentage? Greater than Jesus. No, no, no. Please, please, please. I don't want you to shout, man. Please. Yes. Huh? Huh? Muhammad. Hmm? Not that. <laughs> no. Come on. Come on, my sisters. Yes. Huh? Are you referring to Melchizedek? Melchizedek. Yeah, but he's not greater than God. He's not greater than Jesus. But Jesus who is, is that person whose birth is superior to Jesus? Birth is coming into the world and going out of the world is greater than that of Jesus Christ. No one. No one. So the... I gave you people, you people got very short memories, very short memories. I said, that person is Melchizedek, Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. That's what the Bible says. The high priest of Salem, Salem means Jerusalem. He was a high priest. The Bible says, without father, without mother, without beginning, without end. Can anything be greater than that? Just like God, man, the only one who's got no father, no mother, no beginning, no end is God. And here is the high priest of Jerusalem, Melchizedek, in your Bible. That is the God you should be worshipping, not Jesus. Look, Jesus had a mother. Jesus had a mother. Je she carried him for nine months. She delivered him. And on eight days he was circumcised, like any other human child. Right? When he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. So he was in his mother's womb like any other human child. That's Jesus. This man, Melchizedek, no father, no mother. Look, he had no mother even, no beginning. Jesus had a beginning in the stable. No, he had a beginning in the stable. You say that he was born in the stable. He had a beginning and on the eighth day he was circumcised. So you can see the happening. His mother carried him for nine months. After delivery, eight days time, he was circumcised. And at the age of 30, they say they knocked hells into him and they crucified him. He had an apparent end. He had a beginning and he had an apparent end. This man, Melchizedek, no father, no mother, no beginning, no end. He is like God himself, man, greater than Jesus in your Bible. Worship him. He deserves to be worshipped. Last two questions. The lady over here. Um, I've been told that women in Islam wear a veil because in this way men will treat them respectfully. Um, but I see the veil as a form of oppression because why should they have to cover themselves um, because of the weakness of men? Shouldn't they be treated with respect regardless? Could you please explain the veil? And did Mary have to wear a veil? <laughs> Madam... Madam, your Bible says, your holy Bible says, you know, Paul, Paul, Paul is telling you that the woman must cover her head, that the woman who doesn't cover her, shave off her hair. Your Bible says that. The woman, the woman, who bears her hair, says, shave them off. Shave it off. That's what the Bible says. And you woman, the, your Bible says, she must not be allowed to open her mouth in the church. But that's your churches, they don't believe all that. And your people don't believe in that. So you are inviting trouble. You know, because of this, in America, in New York, no woman is safe after dark. No woman is safe in France. During daytime, women have been raped in the street. 
and people just walk by, looking the fun. Say, oh, maybe they're enjoying themselves. Woman is being raped. No, no. I said, you are inviting it. Look, this modesty, the nuns, the nuns, you know, the nuns, Roman Catholic Church, nobody gives them a second look. If Mary, the mother of Jesus, came along, you won't give her a second look. But my dear sisters, those women on your gold coast, that's a Scarborough and all that with bikinis and tangas and G-strings. Look. Sure. <laughs> it's attracting... <laughs> Look, even an old man like me, I tell you, my God. <laughs> if, if I went there, I tell you, I'll be burning inside. I'm telling you, look, this is the nature of man. God made us like that. The thing that allures man more than anything on earthly existence is woman. Do you know that? I don't know. The Quran says, the Quran says, Fear in the sight of men is the love of things they covet. Number one, women. Then son. You know, I've got 11 sons. I can make my own football team. You know, how, how do, you know, it makes me feel proud. I've got 11 sons, you know. My own football team, my own cricket team. Mm -hmm. Well, Banin, and number three, well, Qanatir al Mukantarat min al Zahabi al Fidda, and hoarded heaps of gold and silver, and wealthy land, and horses branded for excellence, and all this. This is the list that is given in the Quran. Number one, women. The Quran says, the thing that allures man most on this earthly existence is woman. And I'm telling my Western friends that I don't have to prove that to you. I don't have to convince you. I said, you see, in my country, in the city of Durban, city of Durban, I think we'll end with this. We'll end with this. Okay? We'll end with this. In the city of Durban, there is a firm called Lucian Motors. They sell second-hand trucks. You know, lorries, lorries, trucks. You call them trucks here too? Trucks. We call them trucks. And on the trucks that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the truck. Then G North, they sell farm implements. And on the tractors that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. I'm asking these Westerners, I said, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with a second-hand truck or with a tractor? Except the man. You see, the woman is being dangled, so he'll read the advert. And BMW, I don't know you have BMWs here. It's a motor car. It's a motor car supposed to be a little better than the Mercedes Benz. I'm not in the market for it. You see, I started with the Volkswagen Beetle. I did 120,000 miles and I had to change for another Beetle and another Beetle and another Beetle. Then they stopped making the Beetle. You know, Volkswagen Beetle. They started the Golf. So I had to buy Golf number one, Golf number two. I'm still not in the market for a BMW. But I'm forced to read this advert. In my newspaper, I see a BMW motor car and with a woman in the skimpy, skimpiest of bikini, what you call the tanga, you know, the G-string. She, she's standing in front of the motor car and it's, it's written at the bottom, test drive her now. I'm asking, I'm asking, the woman of the car, the woman is buying the car, and her is underlined, let's drive her now. I said, look, this is what you're leading yourself to. This is, the Westerner, he sells his mother, his wife, his daughter, his wife is a star, and she's being mangled on the screen, simulating rape, and they, they enjoy it. You, you enjoy your wife being Simulated. It's not real rape, but you know, it's simulated. You can see everything about it. She's being raped, your mother, your wife, your daughter. And you enjoy, your wife is a star. So, sick, sick. No, alhamdulillah, praise be to God. We haven't come to that sickness yet, we Muslims. We try, we try to keep away from it. This is your pleasure, your privilege. We have no right to force you. But we say, you are playing with fire, my child, and you're going to pay the price. You're paying the price now, and you will pay the price. Well, I'm afraid that brings tonight to a close. I'm sorry. <laughs>
that has to be. The Sheikh is uh, 78 years old. I'm feeling the strain and I'm sure he is. We only have the hall till half past nine. It's now 25 to 10. So if you'd please leave orderly in a quiet fashion and not trample everybody. And say, so I'd like to all just show your thanks and appreciation for what has not only been an entertaining night, but a particularly informative one.